I tell you what, if, if I had nine black riders on horses chasing me to work, I think I would get there a little faster. And if they were chasing me to my devotional closet, I think I would probably be there a little bit more. I think too often, I'm the guy on the back of the horse just like, uh, I'm just sort of along for this crazy ride. And by the grace of God, I escaped that crazy hand that's clawing for my face. But if I, if I wasn't, Underneath God's grace, I'd probably be in a lot of trouble. And I think, man, if, if I could just watch this clip every day before I start my day, you know, maybe that would be the key. Or maybe if I just pick up some scripture and read it. But even more powerful than the idea that God's grace can shelter us from all of this is that we have power over the enemy. You don't have to be the guy flopping on the back of the horse, half dead. Romans 8, 1 to 3 will show you where God, uh, where, uh, excuse me, Paul talks about the fact that the enemy is defeated. Like it's beyond good conquering evil. It's beyond this, this happy story. It's about the fact that Jesus already came and paid the price so that we could not only walk for freedom, but have authority over anything that would come against us. I'm going to give you some scriptures here. In James 4, James talks a lot about double-mindedness and this battle that rages within us. He says in verse 7, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Too many times we, we stop somewhere between submit and resisting. We're not even getting there. Submit yourselves to God, he says. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. This idea of humility keeps coming up. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out the group of apostles and disciples to go witness in groups of two. It says in verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Jesus is saying, I want you to get beyond the perspective that there are these demons that you're battling. This morning, I'm not trying to awaken you to the fact that there are little demons hunting after you and you have to be afraid. No, I want us to be aware and cognizant of them so that we can keep going past them. That our life isn't about them, that we might encounter them, that they might try and assault us and attack us, but they have no authority or power over me. I'm sheltered by Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. In chapter 7, verse 1, he says, Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Are you seeing kind of the pattern that is coming here? It's saying, I need to lay myself down. If I'm going to conquer this, I need to put down this outside garment of flesh, and I have to carry it around with me, sure. But I need to crucify myself to the point where it's not about me, and I can walk in the plan that God has for me. Walk in obedience. Quick reference for that you can write down is Deuteronomy chapter 11. But I want to go back to this story that we read at the beginning, and I want you to notice Elisha's attitude. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16, he says, his servant comes to him, you know, all crazy. These guys are surrounding us, and Elisha says what? Do not be afraid. Does that sound familiar? Remember that all these, every time an angel shows up in Scripture, he says, don't be afraid. And who is not afraid? Everybody is afraid. They're terrified because you're not expecting to see an angel. Well, what is it telling you about Elisha when he sees all these armies surrounding the city and he says, don't be afraid? Elisha's got a perspective that's different than his servants. 
He says to him, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. So the servant gets a blessing because he gets to glean from Elisha's perspective. He's smart because he goes to Elisha first. He goes to somebody who's a little further along in his walk with God than he is. But what if the servant had responded in the natural? Elisha's still sleeping or whatever he's doing inside, and the servant comes out, sees the armies, and he doesn't take the time to find out what's going on. I mean, what would you do? Surrender? I think that is probably the most viable option. I mean, the city is completely surrounded. What else is he going to do? He's pretty much, or he could try and go out there and fight him on its own, on his own, but he's not going to be very successful. But Elisha's got this perspective that took some time to get. It's not just that, I, I think we tend to read these stories and think like, oh yeah, well, he's a prophet. He's got, you know, communication with God, but it's not something that just is magically bestowed upon him. Elisha's taken the time himself to humble himself, to seek out the heart of God, and to walk in obedience to him. So instead, what happens? Well, Elisha prays to the Lord, and the Lord blinds the eyes of the entire army. It's an awesome story. You should read it. And he takes them, and he leads them. He's like, oh, you guys are totally in the wrong place. Let me take you where you need to go. He leads them right into the middle of Samaria, which is the capital of Israel at that point. And their eyes are open, and they're like, oh, man, we're in trouble. You know, and, and, and it's, a, it's an awesome story to read, so I definitely encourage you to read that. But even if you look past that, there's another story in the next chapter, in chapter 7, where you find out, again, the, the Arameans have laid siege to, to Jerusalem, and they're stuck, there's nowhere to go, and through four lepers walking out of the city in boldness, God sends the sounds of chariots and an army, and the whole army flees. I mean, that's a pretty big supernatural encounter. I've been reading through the Old Testament on my reading plan. I don't know where you guys are at. Um, But I get to the point where you're reading through all these kings and every one of them who's like, so-and-so was either awful or he was a good king, but he didn't tear down the high places. You know what I'm talking about? You read through this and he, he was a good king. He did things right. He sought the Lord, but he left the high places, which are these altars to foreign gods. And I'm thinking, reading this, You guys are morons. Just tear them down already. I think it's easy to look back and have this perspective on Scripture and think like, you know, we were just talking about this in the men's meeting, that, you know, I I can't believe they would do this. They wouldn't just serve God. And then we go out and we we encounter the same sort of things that we are leaving up in our lives, these altars, these, uh, you know, idols that we haven't torn down either. And, And I feel like it's time to get serious about it. And I always come away with that decision. Like, okay, Lord, I, I hear what you're trying to say to me. It's, it's really, this time, seriously, I'm going to get serious. Seriously. I'm, I'm really going to do something about this because I'm kind of sick of living the day-to-day and the status quo and the mundane. And I know I'm a Christian and I know you saved me and that's great, but I know that you have way more for me that I feel like I'm not tapping into and I don't know how you guys feel, but I come across that a lot. I feel like, God, there's just, there's just more that I am not tapping into because I'm stuck here. And where here is, is this altar of this other God, this high place that I don't even necessarily think that I'm at, but I'm, I'm struggling and I'm battling where God's saying, I've called you to bigger things. I've called you to move beyond this. And I'm, he's ready, I think, even more than I am for me to step out into what he has for me. It's not not about where we go after we die. We accept him so that we can live our lives for him. Would you watch this one last time?